Hello. Um, this is really an introduction to theology and an introduction to uh, the new faculty of theology here at the Moscow State Pedagogic University, the Moscow State University of Education. It was Wittgenstein who said, um, everything that can be said at all can be said clearly. We will come back to this later, but I, for now I think Wittgenstein's dictum is worth remembering. What is a definition of theology? Well, you can find this in many places. Augustine of Hippo said it was reasoning about the deity. I think the study of theology today encompasses a variety of disciplines, from dogma to ethics, history, biblical criticism, probably comparative religious thought, and possibly um, some sort of language development. It, uh, it, it helps if you are going to study theology, if you have mastered Greek, if you have mastered Hebrew, and uh, I think particularly if you're going to look at uh, Islamic thought, you really have to master Arabic. Um, I, I'm afraid my Arabic is no longer as effective as it once was. Uh, but it still remains that these various disciplines draw on the common theme of theology, and I am not at all sure that St. Augustine of Hippo's definition does the job. If I look uh, on my desk at home, I have three or four editions of the Oxford English Dictionary, and if I look up the word theology in these books, I get a variety of different definitions. Uh, although I love the Oxford dictionaries, they are not altogether that uh, effective. I remember um, the Oxford uh, Dictionary of, um, of, of Greek and English, and I remember there was a, 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 a big question over the use of the word synegasome, uh, which is a wonderful Greek word. In fact, you have, a, you have an equivalent word here in Russia. Um, and uh, when I look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, it gives me three um, possible translations to cooperate, to collaborate, and to work together. And my Greek friends always chose collaborate or cooperate, which have very negative meanings. The best meaning is work together. Um, as a sort of English as a foreign language guide, if there's a possibility of using a phrasal verb, the phrasal verb is the more formal and the more effective translation all the time. These other words have a very precise meaning. Cooperate means to work um, for somebody when you don't really want to, and collaborate means to work with the enemy. So if I looked, well, when, when I looked up the word theology in the Oxford English Dictionary, I found this. It's a study of all system of religion, a rational analysis of a religious faith. Uh, the dictionary used to call theology a, or the science of religion, and at one time it was referred to the queen of the sciences. Um, I think all of these definitions slightly miss the point. Did you know that uh, in the Bible there is no mention of the word theology, there is no mention of the word theologian or theologize, these words are not biblical. And indeed, when you think about the twelve apostles, they were not theologians. Um, I would say most of them were uneducated. If I go back to my childhood, I had a great mentor, a great teacher called Father Basil, many years ago, who pointed out to me that it was only Judas Iscariot uh, the one whose face in orthodox icons will always be painted in profile, who was likely to have had a proper education and to have come from a good family. Um, this is probably a little debatable because you also have St. Matthew, the tax collector. Um, but the argument my teacher gave me went like this. Uh, the name Iscariot came from the Hebrew word Ish, um, karyot, 
a gentleman of Kerios. Uh, there are other etymologies, of course, that have been presented, and some of them are more agreeable. St. Matthew, as I say, uh, was a tax collector and could not quite have escaped education as well, and maybe in the present day he may have graduated from the London School of Economics or in Moscow from the Financial or the Economic Academy. Uh, but when you look at the New Testament, you cannot fail to get a sense that an academic education is not quite encouraged. Uh, if there are people with a pretense to theology, it is the scribes and Pharisees who use weasel words to try to trick Jesus. Education is a license to deceit. But even the scribes and the Pharisees in the first century are never called theologians. That word is even worse than they. That word is the preserve of ancient Greece. It is used, um, it's, it's maybe invented by Plato in the Republic, and later it's used by Aristotle in his debate about eternity, uh, about, about the eternity or otherwise of the universe the cosmos. For Plato, theology was something done by the poets, and they, as we know, in the Republic are condemned. They are um, exiled, forbidden, um, they are censored. And for Aristotle, theology was part of that philosophy which was grounded in what he called the first principles, something that his students later called the metaphysics. Um, so we still have to wait for one of Aristotle's pupils, Eudemus of Rhodes, who wrote the first history of theology, and he was probably the first person to take this subject seriously. Um, but for Eudemus, he is also critical of the history of the gods. So for the early church, the word theology was a dirty word, which meant sceptical. It referred to the activities of the Greek pagans who were speculating about the nature of God, the nature of the gods. And it was only gradually that the term theology was appropriated by the early Christian church, and this happened in Alexandria in the second or the third century, um, and uh, it, it, it was particularly um, put forward by um, St. Clement of Alexandria and Origen, about whom we're going to talk a great deal. Um, they were working in the catechetical school in Alexandria. Uh, now, Origen, of course, is a heretic, the ultimate skeptic, singled out for condemnation in the Fifth Ecumenical Council, and uh, also singled out often by name in the great anathemas at the beginning of Lent and the triumph of orthodoxy, uh, particularly if a bishop is present, he will stand up and he will say, anathema, anathema, Anathema. I remember I was designing a production of the opera Carmen, and during the third act on the mountainside with, in my production, goats, when I wanted to introduce the women's voices, um, I had a backcloth studded with little stars, and I introduced into that backcloth a series of windows that flew open like an advent calendar. And the chorus of women and boys sat at the open windows in the sky and sang very beautifully. And the Metropolitan Callistos, the Bishop of Oxford, was much impressed by this and he said to me, like Origen, you believe that the stars are inhabited by angels. Indeed, it was Bishop Callistos who introduced me to the study of Origen at Oxford, and he has been very much my mentor through the years. So much of what I am saying today is in fact paralleled by, or I hope will be paralleled by, what he says.
At some point, Bishop Callistos uh, quoted the little-known saint Vincent of Lerin, who said, I would sooner err uh, with origin than believe a right with others. Well, the wonder of origin is simply that, the wonder of following his train of thought, and if you have not read any origin, please do so. He is brilliant, and if you need to examine the problem of evil, um, this would be particularly uh, directed at those students who have not quite got to university level. If you need to look at the problem of evil, and if you have got to university level, please make sure you don't forget this. Do, I'm so sorry, do make sure uh, that you look at the idea of apocatastasis. That is something Origen the heretic shares with Clement of Alexandria the saint. Maybe Origen took the theory too far, but I love the idea in the theory of apocatastasis that the devil too may not be beyond salvation. We should be mindful of Origen when we commit ourselves to the study of theology. Words have meaning. And particularly in today's world, our words can be taken out of context and abused on YouTube and Twitter. And we can get into a lot of trouble for saying things casually. Theology is not a casual discipline. We are studying the words and the ideas that form the bedrock, the backbone of people's lives. It is as serious a discipline as medicine. Indeed, if you check what St. Gregory of Nyssa, one of the great doctors of the church, writes, it all seems particularly life-threatening. He says, um, in a, this, this is in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, he says, Imagine, imagine someone who finds himself on a mountain ridge. He is at the top of a sheer steep crag extending downward into a bottomless abyss. Now imagine what this person would probably experience if he put his foot on the edge of the cliff that overlooks the chasm and found below no solid footing and nothing to hold on to. This is what the soul experiences, says St. Gregory, when it goes beyond its footing in material things, in its quest for that which has no dimension and, it, and which exists for all eternity. For here there is nothing it can take hold of, neither place nor time nor measure nor anything else. It does not allow our minds to approach. And thus the soul, slipping at every point from what cannot be grasped, becomes dizzy and perplexed and returns again to what is co-natural with it, content now to know merely this about the transcendent, that it is completely different from the nature of the things that the soul knows. I don't know how many of you have been on a steep mountain ridge. I remember in a journey once along a mountain ridge that I, I, I took in Albania, the land of the eagles, I was traveling there with my Albanian godson and we had been provided with an elderly driver who had brought with him some homemade and pretty potent raki, which he was duly swigging as we drove. We found ourselves on this mountain ridge and from my side of the car, as from his, there was a precipitous drop. Uh, in fact, I seem to recall in my memory that below me I could see clouds. Maybe not true. I was a bit nervous and I turned to my godson and I said, this is very beautiful. You can almost imagine that we are in paradise. And my godson retorted, if the driver doesn't put his hands back on the steering wheel, we shall be in paradise. 
St. Gregory is talking about the shock of leaving the world of the senses. He describes a vertiginous sense, a sense of fear. We are taken out. We are taken out and we step into the unknown. We are in wonder. We tremble. Actually, if you look again at the story of the cave in Plato, you will find much the same experience described for us. Plato speaks of education. St. Gregory of Nyssa speaks of mystical experience, but they share the same sense of moving into unfamiliar territory. We are aware of the gap between the experience of what we know and what we do not know. It is frightening, but it is also as the Americans would put it, awesome. Awesome, what a great word. Stand aright, stand in awe, stand in fear. It is awesome. I think it is worth adding a note here from a wonderful Greek theologian, Constantine Scuteris, who said, we are educated through healthy dogmas and purified. He was talking about the study of theology, but he could have been putting a break on too much speculation what an educational theory might be, an overdose of Piaget or Vygotsky. We need freedom, we need space, but not to the point of danger. We need freedom, we need space, but we also need kindness. We need freedom, but we need to be tested. Experience needs to be tested. As a base rule, I have found doubt to be a great friend and certainty to be something I measure against the traditions I've inherited or to which I subscribe. Certainty is something I treat with great respect and awe. Certainty can be dangerous. Father George Florovsky sums it up rather well. He says, one cannot separate spirituality and theology. Theology can never be separated from the life of prayer and from the exercise of virtue. I like that because it sneaks in a third point that prayer in itself is pointless without the practice of kindness. We can think here of the story from Dostoevsky in the Brothers Karamazov of the woman and the onion, which I'm sure you all know she had died, if you remember, and she found herself in hell. And uh, this is rather unexpected. She thought she'd lived rather a good life, and she remonstrated with Satan. I shouldn't be here, she said. Well, said Satan, is there any kindness that you have ever done? And she thought, probably for eons. And suddenly she remembered that she had given an onion to a passing beggar. At that moment, the hand of God descended, and there in the hand of God was the self-same onion for the woman to grasp. She did so, and she started to rise out of the fiery pit. And just then she felt other sinners grabbing onto her legs, grabbing onto her feet, and struggling to be pulled out of the fiery pit as well. Uh, in fact, I think Dostoevsky describes them all holding on to her toe. And, but she held fast, she gripped that onion. And then she looked down and she was halfway between heaven and hell. She was practically at the gate of heaven and she realized that a long chain of grubby sinners was holding on to her, and in her anxiety to maintain her grip on the onion, she kicked the hangers on. Get off me, she said. It's my onion, she squealed at them. And that moment, the onion snapped, and they all fell back to hell. A demonstration of a supreme lack of kindness, a supreme lack of understanding. Theology is always about kindness. Actually, I can be broader. Education in general is about kindness. Um, one of the things which worries me so much about streaming is that if you are doing well, 
How wonderful is somebody else is doing well too? It doesn't make you any better to ensure that your neighbour does worse. Vladimir Lossky echoes the link between theology and spirituality in the late 1950s. Theology and mysticism, he says, support and complete each other. We'll come back to this too, because I think theology, when it is done correctly, is a bit like a good tennis game. I don't play tennis. I have no eye-ball coordination. But on the one team, you have to imagine, is the rational quest for knowledge, and on the other team is the search for the enigmatic, or put another way, if or as God is infinite, then the more we know about the infinite and his acts, the more enigmatic he and they become. This seems to me to be true when we're approaching theology through any of the great paths. Uh, the tension is evident, for, for example, in the Talmud, in the Islamic texts, and in both Catholicism and Protestantism. Indeed, I remember being told about the furore created by Dr. John Robinson. You may not know about this, but it really is well worth looking up. Dr. John Robinson in the 1960s, who wrote a book, The Myth of God Incarnate. He was a bishop in the Anglican Church who questioned the central narratives of Christianity, the Incarnation and the Resurrection. It was very shocking uh, for a 13-year-old impressionable schoolboy. Anyway, Within a few years, I discovered the self-same man had written a book called Redating the New Testament, which rather than pitch greater challenges to orthodoxy, put huge weight on the role of tradition and overturned what was then the academic assumption that the first gospel to have been written was that of St. Mark. In the sequel, The Priority of John, written just before he died, well, obviously, he went a little bit further. So theology is a balancing act between knowledge and enigma, between knowledge and the mystical. Uh, we must test our best hypotheses against the traditions to which we subscribe, whatever they may be. Now, back to our subject. What did theology mean in the second or third century in Alexandria? Because the Greek fathers certainly understood it in a different way to the ways in which we would understand it in a secular university today. Evagrius of Pontus, or um, if we give him a more Greek name, Evagrius Ponticus, which makes him sound more Greek, but um, Ponticus is also a name which suggests that he is a little mouse. Um, and uh, so anyway, he was a disciple of St. Gregory of uh, St. Gregory Nanzianzus, and he says, if you are a the theologian, you will pray truly, and if you pray truly, you are a theologian. This is why in the Orthodox Church it is monks who preach. The best training for a good theologian must be a life of prayer. For the Greek world, there is, in other words, always a link between theory and practice. Theology for the Greek fathers is not just an academic study. It involves commitment through practice. I am not sure uh, that is quite what I have in mind as we begin this course together. So I want to take another approach, and this is something I got from Bishop Callistos. Um, and... Uh, this is something which, um, this is a subject really, uh, or a character, that was not really known in the Russian church until the mid-20th century. Very well known in the Greek church. Um, the theology of St. Gregory Palamas. Um, and actually only recently uh, has his theology been accepted in the Catholic church. So he is a controversial figure, but a spectacular figure um, uh, with spectacular ideas. Um, 
St. Gregory Palamas says there are three types of theologian, and, and here I am literally quoting Bishop Callistos. The first are real saints. These are those people who have had a personal experience of God, who in St. Gregory Palamas's understanding have seen the light, the uncreated light of God. The second group are those who trust the saints and aim to emulate or reproduce what the saints are saying. Maybe, however, they do not have a personal experience of God. The third group are not saints, do not trust the saints, and do not have a personal experience of God. The third group are bad theologians. That group is the group of skeptics, the same skeptics indeed that we met in ancient Greece. The first group are those who blend theory and practice perfectly. But the second group, well, it's in the second group, I think, that we exist. What I like about Gregory Palamas's description is the idea of trust, the idea that we nurture admiration, wonder, that we work within a tradition, whatever that may be, that however incomplete it may be, we have also made a personal commitment. But wonder, we come back again to that American word, awesome. I think this second description adequately describes all forms of learning. We trust and we explore together in the confidence of sharing a tradition. I started by mentioning Wittgenstein. And I want to recall that quotation again. Everything that can be said can be said clearly. This seems to me to be paralleled by two quotations from the New Testament taken separately. They're quotes that tend to get nodded through, but put together they form an interesting challenge. The first quote is, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, perfectly reasonable there. And the second one is, no one is perfect but God alone a complete contradiction. The Greek fathers of the church certainly dealt with this. Our vocation, they said, is to be perfect, but we are inevitably going to fail. Um, There's then the perfect antinomy. So again, with Wittgenstein, our aim is to be clear, but we, but we must recognize that in all likelihood we are going to present a muddy, thesis. And as theology involves a meeting, an interaction, conversation with the infinite, we are bound in our finite words to stumble. It is what Cardinal Newman, a great 19th century theologian and an Oxford academic, describes as saying and unsaying to positive effect stabbing at solutions in the knowledge that we may never be conclusive. We should recognize our limitations, but never limit our wonder, never stop searching. Christos Yanaris, a great Greek theologian, he says, uh, in the Orthodox Church and tradition, theology has a very different meaning from the one we give it today. It is a gift from God, the fruit of the inner purity of the Christian spiritual life. Theology is identified with the vision of God, the immediate vision of the personal God, with the personal experience of the transfiguration of creation. By uncreated grace, theology is not a theory of the world, a metaphysical system, but an expression and formulation of the church's experience, not an intellectual discipline, but an experiential perception. A participation then, a sort of communion. We can extend, we can look further over the next few weeks at the concept of theosis, very important in orthodox theology. St. Paul tells us, that we are fellow workers with God. That's a theme which would turn up incidentally also in Jewish mysticism, in Kabbalism. So for Yanaris, the study of theology 
is an experience and one done within the context of our community, in this case of our church. Not once, not once, in contrast to the Oxford English Dictionary, that icon of intellectual authority, not once does Yanaris mention science or a rational approach. I would like to think of theology a little bit like I would think of mathematics. I'm not a mathematician. But I understand that to think of mathematics in a proper way, you have to do it. This is in contrast to many other disciplines. If uh, I, I have a choice, I can do art, I can paint a picture, or I can study somebody else's art. The same with music. I can compose or I can study what a composer has already written. I might not be a great musician, but I might be a great musical critic and so on. But theology is something that we need to do. And in the second half of this talk, I'm going to look at the principles that I hope make the doing of theology easier and much more efficient. These principles can be applied to all forms of learning. So they are not exclusive to theology, and I believe they help a great deal. Um, in the work that I've been doing last year, um, we've been looking at a thing called mathetics, the science, the study of learning. We know how to teach, but maybe we need to study how to learn. When the Church Fathers speak of theology, they're also likely to call it a mystery, mysterion. The idea of mystery is itself an issue, and we can turn again to our icon of intellectual authority, the Oxford English Dictionary, and find that a mystery is a conundrum, an unsolved problem, something from Agatha Christie. But for the theologian, a mystery, the mystery, or mysterion, is simply reaching out to infinity, reaching out to God. We can never know God. The deeper we reach out, the greater is the mystery. The more we know, the more we realize we are ignorant. So once again, although we are talking about theology, this is pure Platonism. It's about knowledge. The more we know, the more we recognize there is to know. Uh, to return to the idea of theology and religion, we can look at Psalm 45, be still and know that I am God. For the Orthodox tradition, this would um, call to mind the hesychast, tradition and the workings of the, the theory of the Jesus prayer. But in fact, you see how broad all this is. You see links in every, in every tradition because in the Roman Catholic Church in the 19th century, there's a remarkable um, Italian cleric called Antonio Rosmini, whose dying words were, be still, adore, and rejoice. This brings, um, no, it doesn't. This brings me to apophatic theology, or the negative way, the via negativa, what Father John Mayendorf calls the expression of the inexpressible. We have got used to saying what God is, but it is often much more effective to say what he is not. By making negative statements, it is possible to reach a much more powerful message than simply by using the affirmative. Of course, I quite like the affirmative. I am a great fan, we're actually going to come back to this in a few minutes, of the, um, uh, of the ontological argument. I'm not completely convinced it works, but I enjoy being able to um, parrot 
the definition that St. Anselm gives of God, id quo nihil maius cogitare potest, that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That itself, of course, while it claims to be a positive statement of what God is, is in fact entirely negative too. By making negative statements, it is possible to reach a much more powerful message than simply by using the affirmative. This approach can be found in the works of uh, Gregory of Nyssa, Basil the Great, Dionysius the Areopagite, Maximus the Confessor. Uh, these writers are simply exploring what St. Paul would have called the riddling enig enigmatic way. But I would also want to add the great Jewish rabbi, uh, Maimonides. If you haven't read any Maimonides, The Guide to the Perplexed, do so. Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon. Or if you take the first letters of those, uh, Rambam, who was really the first to adapt Greek philosophy, the Greek philosophy collected by the Arabs, to Western ideas of religion. So he, where, where, where he trod, people like Thomas Aquinas would follow. When we are doing theology in whatever form, we are stretching our language beyond its natural limits in order to glimpse something of divine truth. Our words may therefore appear contradictory. They may be challenging. Sometimes we need to go completely beyond words. In Russia, there's a tradition of the holy fool we, we have this also in the West. You can only think, you can think of um, the fool in King Lear who has license to speak the truth. Um, but I think probably one of the best depictions of the fool is in Islamic tradition in uh, the south of Turkey, the stories of Nas Reddin Hodja. But there is another very rich resource here in Russia. We only have to walk out of this lecture room and into any of the churches around the city and we can approach theology in a thoroughly wordless form through the icons that again and again maintain a balance between theology and mysticism, the rational, the emotional, art and prayer. Particularly here in Russia, if you uh, find icons from a particular era in the Novgorod school, um, you can see apophatic theology in practice where, for example, you have an icon of Christ and around him is a blue-black nimbus showing the incomprehensible divine presence, the darkness of the unknown, unknown by man, the divine essence um, from which shines forth, as Gregory Palamas would say the uncreated and unknowable divine energies, a paradox made present in paint. Now let's come to the three principles which I mentioned earlier. Three principles I would have are joy, space and kindness. Plato says that the beginning of philosophy is wonder. I would say the beginning of philosophy is joy. The purpose of education is not to indoctrinate, but to educate, from the Latin word, educere, to lead out, to inspire, quite literally, to inspire, inspiro. Um, I went to see Harry Potter in the theatre just before I came back to Moscow, and there were moments of pure joy in the first half of the show. In the second half, I fell asleep, but the first half was truly magnificent. Uh, I took a young Harry Potter fan who was bewitched by what was happening. And more than once I heard him audibly breathe in um, as the Dementors flew over our heads as wizards dueled with one another um, in the air. Great stuff, but note, he breathed in. What is that word in Latin again? Inspiro. To breathe in. He was inspired. If inspiration is about breathing in, then education is about leading out. Education is linked to inspiration.
being led out, conjured up, evoked, to be filled with wonder, to be joyful. Now, on the subject of Harry Potter, there is something else I could add, because I said I saw the play with a Harry Potter fan. His experience was different to mine. I am not a fan. He is. And it struck me that this difference is a good image of the mess that we have made of my subject throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. In the past, we approached theology from a position of belief. And let's say we looked at Aquinas or Anselm's proofs um, for the existence of God. When we approach these proofs today, we can pretty much dismiss them because they cannot establish on realistic grounds belief in a hostile world. Um, they cannot establish in this world of unbelief uh, the existence of God. They were never supposed to do this. St Anselm was never challenging Bertrand Russell's atheism, whatever he thought the fool might actually say in his heart. We know the story of Bertrand Russell charging across the quadrangle in Cambridge and as he leaves his room he says, great God in boots, the ontological argument is right and by the time he gets across to the other side of the quadrangle he realizes that he is wrong. But think for a moment that two minutes as he was crossing the grass of the Cambridge quadrangle, that two minutes is pure theology, that is theology happening. The what if moment, the moment of joy, of wonder, the moment of possibility. When, philosophic, when philosophical thought grasps the divine, or almost. But it is not quite what Anselm intended. Anselm was writing as, in Latin, fides quarens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. He was, in other words, if you go back to Harry Potter, um, in the position of Stefan, a fan, ardently believing. Like Stefan, St Anselm will keep the faith. For my part, I can hardly stop myself telling you how the Harry Potter and the cursed child ends, but it's okay. And that's all right, I fell asleep, so in fact I don't know. St Basil the Great warns us, our understanding is weak and our tongue is even more defective. We cannot really make theology do the impossible. That is the point. Theology is fascinating. It is a brilliant way to develop the mind. Whether we are looking at biblical exegesis, patristic theology, or even the philosophy of religion, actually I would go on to claim that um, philosophy of religion is the best way to introduce a student to abstract thought. So the tools or the individual disciplines of theology can certainly stand alone, but the test of good theology is the practice in prayer and kindness that accompanies it. Theology is about our goal and our reality. There is, a, there is probably a division between the two, but if we are not quite getting there, we can still aspire to it. In other words, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect and no one is perfect but God alone. I think joy is the greatest tool in our learner's toolbox. When I was teaching at a school in Greece, the head teacher called me out one day and rebuked me. She said, there is too much laughter in your class. She was of the opinion that a healthy class involved proper suffering. I do not believe that. I also do not think that is the way to do theology. If we've lost our joy and wonder, then we are no longer exploring. Or rather, I am exploring and you have gone to sleep. I know we've taken quite a long time. Wordsworth tells us that we might be surprised by joy. It's in a poem where he's suddenly wondrous and awestruck, although he's mourning the death of his daughter. How wonderful is that? I know today that I've been a bit heavy-handed with this talk, but imagine a few more jokes to spice things up. Add them 
uh, in your notes. They are intended. I just don't have time to tell them. So joy and exploration, discovery, relaxation, all of these things form the first of my three principles. The second principle is space. And this must be seen in its correct context. Proper space is about freedom to move. On the train, and I'm about to teach in a wondrous school in Wales, St John's, so I will experience very soon many train journeys down from rugby. But on the train, don't you feel constrained, squashed, longing for space? Even if you are sitting on the aisle, even worse, in an aeroplane on my way over here to Moscow on Friday, we tried to land five times in an almighty storm. One and a half hours of unendurable tension, the worst storm in 60 years, apparently. Feeling our freedom had been taken away. But with freedom, there is also responsibility. There can be no real education without freedom. But again, it's about searching. The truth will make you free. John 8. God does not compel. God is not a tyrant. God invites. And freedom allows us to explore different ideas. We will not always agree. I certainly hope we will not. We actually need space to make mistakes. I hope ours will be an environment where you feel you are safe to err, better to err here. I rather wish Origen had been my student. I hope I would have given him the freedom to make mistakes before it got him into trouble. And this leads me to the third principle, which is kindness. So, freedom, joy, and kindness. Kindness. Again and again I've spoken of community, and tradition, but it's summed up in Christianity by kindness. It's there in Judaism as well, chesed, by reciprocity, the golden rule due to your neighbour, by the icon of the Trinity. You only have to look at the famous icon by Andrei Rublev. Um, we, as we are created in the image and the likeness of God, so we aspire to work together, to share. Do you remember the Greek word from the Oxford Greek English Dictionary, synergasme, to work together, to collaborate or cooperate. We share, we live among and with and for one another. So together we can surely build a better future. Now, the next talk I'm going to give will be on the theology of the icon. After that, we really need to have a look at some biblical exegesis and the traditions of biblical scholarship.